I'll be reading from John chapter 14, 5 and 6. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If I were to try to tell you today how to get to my house, one of the cool things about modern technology is probably all you would need, if you have no idea where I live, is an address. And we've all got cell phones or GPS or somehow, navigation on the car. You plug that address in and it takes you there. It hasn't always been that way. And those of you who grow up with that technology and that kind of thing, I know it's, it's a, uh, a great thing and, and a lot of fun, but I ask you to remember those of us who had to do it the old-fashioned way and either read a map or ask for directions. Right, right. And us guys don't like to do that. Uh, that's just, I don't, I don't know, maybe some of you are different. We don't like to, we, we want to depend on, I can do it myself, right? Um, and for my wife, she says, that's your famous last words because it usually means we're lost or we're going there soon. <laughs> and it's probably right, probably the way it is. Um, you remember those directions, though, weren't always all they were, all you hoped they would be because uh, there were good directions and there were bad directions. And we've had both. We, we, we often, and sometimes there were directions that were really difficult to follow just because they were, I mean, we, you drive through a small town, for instance, and I, I'm guessing it was the same way here as it was in Ohio. If you drive through a small town or you're driving in the country and you'd say, hey, where's the nearest McDonald's? And someone who's lived in this area for a while, they'd say, well, you go down this road about, about oh, a couple of miles, and that could be any number of miles. Go down this road a couple of miles, you come to where the old gas station was. You remember that old gas station? No, sir, I'm not from here. Well, you ask anyone in town, they know where the old gas station was. And you turn left right there. It was impossible sometimes just to, just to figure it out. We all have different ways of, of giving directions. Uh, if you ask my wife and I for directions to a place, I'm going to say go north on this road and, and turn right, go, go east on that one, and, and, and the building will be on your left. She's going to say, go to the Walmart and turn, and turn this way and, and then go down to where you see the pretty flowers all planted. She, she's visual, right? She sees things. So it, it, and you go to the person that speaks your language, right? Because when, when I go to someone and they start saying, well, you go down to the, to the Walmart and go this way, I'm going, where's, where's somebody that speaks my language? I, I, don't, I need road names and directions. That's, that's what I need. And, and, and my wife's the same way. If, don't start talking to her about north. She doesn't want to hear that, right? She wants to hear you go this way. So directions are different. Like I said, different people gave good, some gave good directions, some gave poor directions. I remember, and sometimes those directions gave you a crisis, especially if you were having to be somewhere on time. I was going with another preacher friend to a, a funeral one time, and he was driving. And uh, his son, teenage son, was, was in the back of this Dodge Caravan that we were driving. Uh, and we were, we'd, he had gotten directions, had them written out on this, on this piece of paper uh, to this really small town in Indiana somewhere. And we were driving, we'd been driving for about an hour, and we're starting to look going, man, it's getting close to time, and I'm not seeing the, the turnoff. And so we, he finally, he pulled over, we got the map out, we tried to figure it out, it took us several minutes to figure it out, and we realized that in the directions they had missed a turn that we were supposed to take. And we didn't know that. And so we're 10 miles, we'd gone 10 miles beyond that turn, and the funeral was supposed to start in just a few minutes. And this preacher friend of mine, uh, who's, a, who's in a bit, a bit of an adventure, he said, they can arrest me there, but I'm not going to be late to that funeral. And he turned that Dodge Caravan around, and in no time that speedometer was passing 100. Two preachers in a Dodge Caravan going 100 mile an hour to a funeral. Just one of those things you can't write. You know, you can't make that kind of stuff up. Uh, we, as, as, the, as the needle goes past 100 miles an hour, the van starts to shudder. And he goes, huh, this thing's got a little shimmy at 100. <laughs> yes, sir, I'm, I'm guessing most of them would. But it's, uh, again, bad directions can, put you, can get you in trouble. Thankfully, in our spiritual walk, 
there's really only one direction that we require, and that's Jesus. Can I get an amen on that? Jesus is our way. He's the, he's the direction to where we are going. His disciples didn't completely understand that yet. As we pick up where we left off last week, last week we talked about when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples and the, the, the communication he gave to them at that time about how they were to do for one another as he did for them. They didn't know it at that point in time, but Jesus is, is preparing them for a speech that he's going to give them that's his farewell declaration. It's his farewell speech. And, and John gives us in great detail Jesus' farewell message to his disciples. In fact, it, it lasts from about chapter 13 in John when he starts it uh, all the way through chapter 17 in John. So that, that much information we have as Jesus prepares his disciples for when he will no longer be there. After the foot washing that Jesus gave them in, in chapter 13, he announces that he's going somewhere that they can't follow. And you get the sense that they pick up on this immediately. They're going, he's, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere and where I'm going, you can't follow. Peter asks him, Lord, where are you going? He goes, well, where I'm going, you can't follow. Now, again, pick this, take this from the, the mindset of where the disciples are. They're, they're in Jerusalem. They believe that they've come there at least in part to take part in an, in an uprising. They still believe, they believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but they still believe that the Messiah has come to be king, a literal, a physical king, an earthly king with an earthly kingdom, and that they are going to be part of an uprising that eventually runs the Romans out, gets rid of the Jewish government at the time, including King Herod, and establishes Jesus on the throne of David, and he would rule over a, a united Israel once again, that took great prominence in the world. That's their vision of what's happening here. And so you can imagine their confusion at many times among this speech, but at this point, Jesus saying, yeah, I'm going somewhere, and where I'm going, you can't follow. Hang on. How does that, how does that fit in with us being a part of your kingdom? You've been talking about this kingdom, and they just you can see their minds are kind of blown in this situation. And then he goes on in, in chapter 14. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would, would I have told you I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that, where, so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Keep verse 4 in mind there. Keep your, keep your finger on verse 4 because we're going to get into that in just a second. Jesus talks about where he's heading. And where he's heading is where all of us are hoping to head as well. This, this concept of life after this life. And it's a big theme in the book of John. Jesus, when, he, when, he talks, when John talks about life, he's talking about not only our physical earthly existence, but also the life that goes beyond after this physical life is over. He talks about not, uh, life in terms of eternity, not just life in terms of what we experience here in this world. And John is, is showing us through Jesus that he's going to this other world. He's going to the place beyond, to his father's house, to, be, to begin to prepare a place for those who would follow him into his kingdom as his disciples lead them in that direction. He starts off with the words, do not let your hearts be troubled. And that, again, you can't read that outside the context of what he said in chapter 13. I'm going to a place, and where I'm going, you can't follow. You get the sense that after he said those words, he was looking at some really confused, sad, and disappointed faces. They didn't understand what he meant by that. Why, Jesus, would you say that? And you get the sense they're hurt, and he sees their trouble. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Just believe. You believe in God, believe also in me. So much he's not saying there, but he's, but he's telling them, listen, things are about to go in ways that you don't expect. You know, you're not going to see this coming. How many times does he say that to us, right? Things are about to go in ways that you didn't expect. You're not going to see this coming. Things that have taken, you think about uh, detours that your life has taken from what you expected it to be as you've moved forward. 
even to this point, and I, and I would bet for most of us, there's more detours ahead where Jesus is saying, listen, you believe in God, you believe God's got you, I've got you, things aren't going to go the way you planned. You believe in God, believe also in me, just believe. And he's preparing his disciples for what's about to take place. Jesus tells them in his speech that lies ahead through chapter 17, as I said before, that, that, there, there was going, that when he leaves, the Holy Spirit will come. This, this comforter, this advocate will come and will take his place. And he tells them, it's better for you if I go. Because if I go, then the Holy Spirit will come. And he'll show you where you should go and what you should do. He encourages them in chapter 15 to stay connected to the true vine. The last of the seven I am statements, I'm not going to get to cover this one because of time. But in chapter 15, I'll come back to it another time, he talks about, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Stay connected to me, he's saying, in chapter 15. Then in chapter 16 and 17, he prays for his disciples and for those who would come after them, that they all would be unified and would stay unified in them. In chapter 14, and we're going to stay in early part of chapter 14 this morning, he gives them the, those ultimate directions where he's going. And in that first part, he said, I'm going back to my father's house. It has many rooms. And in those rooms, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. Now, it's interesting. We even sang a song this morning where it talked about mansions. And I've, I've seen this before, but, but read, in reading the commentary that I use to kind of prepare for these lessons, it, it talks about how ma- mansions was a transliteration that, that those who translated from Latin to English used for the word room. In the, in the Latin, ma- mansion or manzen, something along those lines, means room. And they transliterated that, and we've taken it, but that's not a great transliteration for us, right? Because when we hear mansion, we think, oh, big house. And it, it's a, it is a big house, obviously, but in the Jewish mindset, when he said, in my father's house are many rooms, when a son would get married, they would build a house onto the family homestead or build a room onto the family homestead where he and his bride and his family would be raised. They usually had family compounds. And, and as the, the family got larger, the dad's house would get larger. That's what the disciples are seeing. When, that's what's going through my, their minds when he said, in my father's house are many rooms and I'm going to prepare one for you. We're going to build a room onto dad's house and you get to live in it. You're going to be there in our family compound. And he, he gives them the concept of heaven as being this place where we'll all live in this, in this house, this, this place that God has prepared for those who follow and who believe in him. And we'll be one of, it's, it's not so much having a nice place to live, it's being considered one of the family. That's what he's telling them. That when you get to heaven, when you get to the next life, that you'll live with God in a place that he's prepared for you and you will be considered one of the family. That's what he wants them to see. And in that family, we go and we live with with God and we be with him forever. My family used to sing the song, Mansions Over the Hilltop. You you know that song. And we used to sing it in the car. And mom would sing alto and dad would sing lead and my brother and I would fight over tenor and bass. Uh, Both of us are tenors, so we, we didn't do bass very well. But we sang that song and man, we sang it with gusto. And, and it, I hear now, I, I know now as I look at it that, that's, that some of the song was based on some bad theology or bad translation, but still, it's a song that brings hope. And I think any song that helps us to look over on the other side, whether it's mansions or rooms or heaven or whatever it is, none of us are going to have a perfect vision of what that looks like, but it gives us all hope because we know that on the other side, there's a place for us. Don't know what it's going to look like yet. But if it's in heaven and the streets are paved with gold, I can only imagine what the houses are built with, right? It's going to be amazing. And we have that hope of life eternal, once this life is over, with God. And he's, he's going to share that with us. Now back to verse 4. <clears throat> Jesus kind of sets his disciples up with verse 4. As he says, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And it's kind of like... Asking, it's, it's kind of like setting it up, hoping someone will ask you a question. If I go to Zach and say, Zach, I've got a surprise. I'm kind of hoping he'll come back and say, oh, what you got? Right? Because I want to I wanna answer that question. And, and I want to I answer the question that he asked me next. 
Jesus kind of sets his disciples up when he says, you know the way to where I'm going. I, I, in my mind, I, don't, I wasn't there, but in my mind, I, I kind of see there being a moment of silence. And finally, Peter for once was quiet. Thomas beats him to the, to the point. Thomas who later will, and we're going to talk about him next week, but Thomas who later will, will have this real struggle with whether to believe in Jesus after he sees his, his friend and his Lord die on the cross. Thomas says, wait a minute. How, if we don't know where you're going, how can we know the way? We don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? And I get the sense that there's a very dramatic pause as Jesus turns and we get the next couple of verses, verses 5 through 7. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And later on, Philip kind of steps in it a little bit as he says, well, just show us the Father and and everything, and, and that we'll consider that enough. And Jesus says, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Let me say it plainly. I, I, he's in me, I'm in him. We're one and the same. Thomas will later be the one that sees Jesus and says, my Lord and my God. He'll be the first one to declare that Jesus is God. And we're going to talk about that next week as we, as we look at what happened after Jesus came back from the resurrection. But in this point in time, they're still really confused about that whole Jesus is God kind of thing. That whole one being one with the Father. The Father's in me and I'm in him. And what I say is really what he said. He tells me everything to say. They hear that, but you get, you, and we don't get it completely. None of us understand it completely. But they're really struggling with it in this situation. But Jesus makes it really clear that if you want to get to the Father, if your ultimate goal is to live in His presence and to be with Him, there's only one way. There's only one way to get to the Father. The directions are clear. Jesus is one of those direction givers that you just can't miss. If you want to get there, that road only goes through Him. It only goes through Jesus. It's one of these, it's the sixth of the seventh I am statements that John gives us. And in that, the I am is emphasized by the way the wording is, is done in the Greek. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It defines me. And if you want those things, you have to come through me. And in that, John brings out several of his key concepts First of all, when he says, I am the way, it's, it's John's core message. The, the message of his gospel is that, is that Jesus is the way to get to God, that Jesus is the one and that there is no other way to get to the Father, to get to heaven, to get to the great beyond than to go through Jesus. He says, I am the truth. That goes back to the first chapter when we, when in chapter 1, verse 14, when he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The concept there is the word of God, Jew thinks of the law, right? The written word of the law became flesh. John indicates Jesus, that now Jesus is the perfect expression of the Father. Whereas the law before, the Hebrew writer will tell us, the law before was not a perfect expression. Jesus is a better expression of God than was the law, than was the written word. It's not the written word that we follow anymore. It's a living Christ. And John is saying, not, not that the law is a bad thing, and, and all, the, all the writers, New Testament writers from here on out will say, we're not saying anything bad about the law. We're simply saying that God gave us Jesus to give us a living way. He gave us Jesus as a perfect expression, one that isn't subject to interpretation. A perfect expression of the will of God is, is what is wrapped up in the person of Jesus. It's who he is and it's what he is. Jesus is truth, period. And then he says, I am the life. And whenever John uses the word life like we've talked about before, he doesn't just mean earthly life. 
He means a life that will never end, eternal life. And it's a, it's a phrase that John repeats over and over and over again uh, in the Greek, uh, Ionia Zeos. Uh, and and it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a concept, that eternal life that God offers through Jesus and what he, what he gives because of his grace and his mercy. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. I've heard some say it even, even recently. And I, think, and I think it applies or appeals to, the, to our world and the, the good nature of our world. I, right now, the, the common thing or the cool thing in, in our world is to, to be open and accepting for everyone. No judgment, right? That's, we, we don't want any judgment. And we get that, and, and in part, we can buy into that. I think all of us can admit that at times we've been judgmental. And we've looked at people in judgmental kind of ways. We've been overly harsh on behaviors that we don't, that we don't struggle with and underly harsh on those that we do. And we've been judgmental. Some would say that this statement that Jesus makes could be seen that way as judgmental. I would say that it's just Jesus giving us a statement of fact. You see, and if you give me that next slide, Jesus has, Jesus in this, or many people in this world look at Jesus and says, he is a way, right? Jesus is a way. Have you ever heard someone say that? That there are, there's one God, but there's really many ways to get to him, right? All the religions in the world, they all kind of point to a similar thing, all kind of point to the same thing, and there's, there's a lot of ways to get there through all of these religions. If that's true, then what Jesus said could not be true. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And one of the, one of the options we have to look at in the, in the trifecta of Lord, liar, and lunatic is, is, is what, what is Jesus? Is he Lord? Is he a liar? Or is he a lunatic? And if he says, I am the way, and he's not, then he's a liar. But I got to tell you, the Jesus I serve is no liar. And that when he says, I am the way, he means exactly that. That there is no other way. It is only him that we go through. I don't mean to judge anyone. But I can tell you that if you serve Muhammad, or if you serve Buddha, or if you serve Vishnu, or if you serve at the feet of science, that there are good people in all of those religions, good people who do all of those things. But according to this, they have no way of getting to the Father unless they turn to Jesus. That's it. That's the only way. And that when you're a Christian, all other religions have to fall by the wayside. You can't serve more than one. Our world wants, to be, wants us to believe that we can, that we can serve more than one religion, that we can say, oh, well, you know, everybody's going to be okay, you know, that, and that's kind of our, again, our culture and how we want to be. But here Jesus says, if you want to get to the Father... If that's the goal, if that's where you're going in life, if you want to get to this eternal life, there's only one way you get there, and that's through him. Jesus is the way. Like the Jews of the first century, however, this turns back to us. Jews of the first century believed in, in that point in time that they, could, that they got to the Father. Think about it. How did they get to the Father back then? Obeying the law, right? By being good enough, they had to, to, to obey all the tenets of the law, all the requirements of the law, and when they were good enough, and the Pharisees, for instance, believed that they were, that they could be, and that they had they'd achieved good enough status, Paul gives us a little glimpse into their mindset when he talks about himself as a Pharisee, and he says, by, by the law or by that legalistic righteousness, I considered myself to be faultless, perfect, absolutely sinless. Pharisees believed that they could get there. That you get to the Father by being good enough. In Romans, Paul tells us, even the Old Testament said, that nobody was actually good enough. That Jesus was the only one to accomplish the status of being good enough in this world. And so we can't get to the Father by being good enough. <clears throat> Some of us still try. Some of us still look at our our behaviors, our service, this is, look at the good things I'm doing, and we want to play those things up. We want to look the part 
of being the perfect Christian. We want to not show our brokenness and where we failed. We want to earn, at least in the eyes of others, our way to heaven. But Jesus didn't say the way to the Father is through your own works and through your own good behavior. We also, sometimes we want to believe that we can get to heaven by our knowledge of the Bible. And again, I don't want to discourage anyone from reading knowing the Bible. I think that's, that's a, a great pursuit. It's what we all want to do. But even the best exegete, even the one with the most sound doctrine, even the one who has a, a perfection in, interpre- in an interpretive strategy, even those people, as they, and, and nobody is, is there yet, but even those who are the best in those fields, again, are not going to get to God through knowing the Bible. Jesus, as Jesus is revealed in the Bible, we can get to know Jesus, and as we get to know Him, we get to know the way. It's not through works. It's not through our knowledge. It's not through our doctrine that we get to go to the Father. We get to the Father one way, Jesus. And when we follow His directions, they're plain, you come through me. No one, He said, will get to the Father except through me. And as we pursue those ends, following Jesus, in our first lesson of this series, He's the light of the world. We said it's not only a a glowing light that, that shines everywhere, but it's also a light that illuminates a path that shows us the direction and how we need to go in this world. And when Jesus says, I am the way, he means that it's good to know the Bible, it's good to do good works, it's good to do all of those things, but the way to the Father is simply to follow in his steps. We want to follow in the steps of Jesus. That's what takes us to heaven, and it's where we go. It's not being judgmental when we say that those who don't go through Jesus aren't going to get to the Father. It's simply reading Scripture. That's the words Jesus said that they will not get there except through him. So I hope and I want to encourage us as we move forward through this series of lessons in, in John. Next week we're going to, again, talk a little bit about Thomas, who he was and, and his role in Jesus' life and in that final encounter that we see in the book of John that Jesus has with the, the risen and glorified Christ. And, and we'll see Thomas' response when he sees and understands what Jesus went through for the sins of mankind. This week, I'd like for us to be thinking of of following the way, of following the, the way to Jesus, of what we do, our good works, our Bible knowledge, and the other things that we do are only there to honor Him, to lift Him up. And that's motivation enough. That's motivation for us to be in Scripture every day. It's motivation for us to be doing good things at every opportunity but continuing to realize that those things in no way allow us to earn our salvation, but that that only comes at the foot of the cross, at realizing the enormity of the gift that was given to us in Jesus, of the enormous price that was paid for our sins, paving the way for us to have the gift of eternal life with God in heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This morning, I invite you to make him your, your way your truth, and your life. This next week is in many circles called Passion Week. Today is the day that Christians look back and and celebrate the fact that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And he did so on the back of a a young donkey as people put palm leaves down and said, blessed is is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. And on this day that many years ago, Jesus rides into into Jerusalem in a humble way, proclaiming through the prophets that he is the Messiah. He would would get the the attention of the Jewish leaders, and the people began to gather around him. He would go to the temple and clear out the money changers. He would heal sick people, heal disabled people. He he shared a a dinner with with his disciples. He went to pray to his father in a very intense way. He was arrested in that garden. He was accused falsely, and he was sentenced to die on a cross, and he did. He died on a cross because of his love for you and me. 
And he says, the only way to get to the Father is to follow me, to walk that same path. Moving towards Jesus as our end goal. That, our, that that same path, our paths all must converge at the cross where we lay our burdens down, where we hand our sins over to the one who loved us so much that he gave his life for us. And we say, Jesus, it's just you. You're the way, the only way. I hope that you've said that in your life and that that's how you're living, that you're living as G- with Jesus as your way, that you're following in his humble loving footsteps. But if this morning your footsteps have gotten away from him, he's always one to welcome us back. To welcome us back into his fold to be his child and to continue on that path that leaves us that leads us to the many rooms that have been prepared for us one day in heaven. I want you to know that it's my desire. It's my hope and my goal to be there one day. And I don't want one of you to miss that. I want us all to be there together. In God's presence, surrounding, surrounded by His glory, surrounding His throne and singing with the, with the elders and the heavenly hosts, the songs of praise to God in that place. And ask, one of, ask that none of us miss that opportunity to be with Him. But to get there, we're told this morning in our text how to do that is through Jesus. If you've not encountered Him this morning, it's, a, it's not a difficult thing to do at all. That encountering him is no more than confessing your sins and in faith realizing that he's the only answer to those sins. Taking taking your step towards him in faith and submitting to him in baptism. Having your sins washed away and rising to walk in a new life. That can be done in just a matter of a few minutes. And that puts you on that way. The way that he illuminates. The pathway that was tread by him before is to be tread by all of us. As we move towards that heavenly home. And we spend eternity with him one day. If that's not the way you're on, again, don't leave this morning without being sure that that's where you're going. Whatever you have a need of this morning, we're going to sing a song here in just a second to encourage you to do what God wants you to do. To encourage you to be on that path. If you feel like you or a loved one or someone you know has gotten off of that path, then you'd like for us to pray with them or pray with you this morning. We have men around the room, people in the back that would love to pray with you. And to, to, to encourage you or them on that path. The content of those prayers, your your requests, will not be made known publicly unless you specifically ask it to be. If this morning you're ready to get on that path that leads to Him, if you're ready to take Him on in baptism, call Him your Lord and Savior and walk the path that He walked, then we want to be with you on that this morning as well. Whatever you need, please let us know. You can come forward or see one of the ones who are standing around the auditorium. Let us know what you need to make your path, make your way the way of Jesus. Let's stand as we sing this song. I encourage you to do that. He came to live.